my pleasure to uh, introduce John Sampalis. He is uh, president of JSS uh, Medical Research. Uh, he is a C CEO and CSO, uh, and uh, the company was founded in 1997. He is a tenured professor of surgery and medicine at McGill University, uh, the University of Montreal, and the University of Laval. Throughout his career, he has re received numerous scholarships from provincial and uh, uh, federal funding agencies, including the Medical Research Council of Canada, the National Health Development Program, and the uh, Fond de la... Oh, boy. Uh, this is... My French is terrible. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> it's the Research Foundation of Quebec. Ah, perfect. Okay. Uh, my apologies. Uh, with, with over 200 peer-reviewed publications in high-ranking journals and more than $15 million in research funding, Dr. Sampalis is recognized as one of the top clinical epidemiologists in the world with expen extensive expertise in clinical trials, health services research, health economics, and outcome assessment, as well as biostatistics. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Good. Uh, thanks. We'll go to the first slide then. The second one, sorry, after that. Slide number two. Oh, Sam, are you able to, to advance? Sorry. There you go. So the, the FDA has recently defined real-world evidence as the clinical evidence regarding the usage and potential benefits of or risks of a medical product derived from analysis of real-world real data. And this is going to be the subject of our talk today and specifically how real-world evidence could help biotechs in their um, drug development program and in um, raising and sustaining financing for their for, for for their companies. Next slide, please. So real world evidence is generated from real world studies, which we use to collect real world data that are patient centric data collected during the routine care of patients um, under routine, uh, in routine care of patients under real world conditions. Once we collect the data, we analyze, we analyze them and come up with results. And the analysis of real world data is a very complicated uh, issue, a very complicated task because of the specific peculiarities of how we collect and, and, and the nature and the quality of the data that are collected in a real world setting. Finally, when we accumulate da data from several real world studies, we end up with an integrated pool of real world evidence that could be used to support our, our hypotheses. Next slide, please. The, the definition, the strict definition of real world studies uh, is the unobstructed observation of the, uh, of the occurrence of the disease, and more specifically, the unobstructed observation of the patient journey, disease evolution, management and treatment of the disease in a routine real-world setting, process outcomes associations by which we actually assess the impact of our actions as healthcare providers or the impact of healthcare systems or anything that is done in terms of an intervention. And by intervention, I'm using the broad definition, not necessarily treatments, but anything else that is done that is related to health. Interventions could be policies or laws, etc. And what we are looking at is the association between these uh, processes and the outcome of the disease in patients. These studies place a particular emphasis on the assessment of the impact of treatments because in most cases, what we are interested in, in assessing is how do particular treatments affect the course of the disease and the outcomes of the patients. All of this is done under the scope of what we call uh, clinical epidemiology. And in fact, the subject matter of epidemiology 
is exactly the, exec the design, the execution, the analysis, and interpretation of real-world studies. Next, please. There are four types of real-world studies, or real-world studies could be classified into the following four general categories. Epidemiological studies, clinical epidemiological studies, health services research, and clinical studies. Go to the next slide, please. Epidemiological studies essentially study or assess how much of the disease are we observing. More specifically, this is concerned with the incidence and the prevalence of the disease in the population. The next question, the disease epidemiology uh, general scope of objectives asks is, where does the disease occur? And this is when we look at geographical variations in the incidence or prevalence of the disease and any trends that are involved over time. In other words, is the disease incidence or prevalence increasing, changing, in any way or staying the same or is being reduced. An important element of epidemiological studies is the assessment of the, what we would call the epidemiological profile. In other words, who is at risk for getting this disease in terms of demographics, genetics, occupation, habits, residence, comorbidities, or use of concomitant medications. When does this disease occur? Does it occur at a particular age? at a particular milestone of our development, after a certain duration or volume of exposure, or when certain other things happen at the same time? This is a very important question to, un to ask and understand the answer because we need to know if we are following patient populations, at which point in time we need to pay particular attention for the incidence of certain diseases. Finally, we need to figure out how does the disease get to the human population? Is it through a vector, as, such as a virus? Is it through uh, exposure to a particular substance? Is it through genetics? Is it through uh, occupational hazards? Or is it through specific habits that uh, the, the, the people might have, such as smoking and drinking? Then we need to understand how much does the disease affect our society? What is the burden of illness? For this, we assess morbidity, mortality, quality of life, and of course, healthcare costs. These are all very important parameters that allow us to ascertain how much the disease is affecting uh, our populations and our society in general. Next slide, please. Clinical epidemiological studies are another branch of real world studies that have a very specific focus on assessing the treatment gap. What we mean by treatment gap is when we observe insufficient or suboptimal effectiveness of an approved treatment or an approved process or a process that we're expecting to improve the health of the population. And this insufficient or suboptimal effectiveness is benchmarked against what we have seen in controlled clinical trials that led us to approve this treatment for use in the population. The only way that we can assess and measure this treatment gap is with post-approval studies, which are part of the real-world evidence general category. Next slide, please. The subject matter of post-approval studies are, is, are the following, real-world effectiveness and safety. This is the most important outcome that we're going to see in most of these real-world post-approval studies. What we're trying to assess here is whether the, the, the treatment that we are looking at works as we had expected it based on the results we have seen in controlled clinical trials. And this is an important point because we need to know that if there is variation between what we observed in clinical trials and what we are observing in the real world, this treatment cap, gap, where is it coming from, and what could be the impact of this treatment cap on the population health. Once we have assessed and measured real-world effectiveness and safety, we want to understand the variation in real-world effectiveness. In other words, is it the same for all the patients across all patient groups? Is it, is it not the same for all patients? Do some patients do better than others? 
Is there a geographical variation, etc.? In relation to this, once we understand or once we measure the variation, we need to understand what are the determinants of the real world effectiveness variation and effectiveness and safety, of course. Next. When we start thinking of the determinants of the variation and effectiveness and safety of treatments that have been that are being used in routine care, we always be, begin with the patient. And these are the the some of the parameters that we're looking with respect to the patient, the genetics, socioeconomic status, demographics such as race and age, and any other comorbidities. What we need to ask ourselves, could any of these factors affect how the patient responds to certain treatments? And this is very important because for some patient subgroups, some treatments might be effective, effective and others may not. And this might mean that we may need to change the kinds of treatment that we're giving according to these patient characteristics. Next. The other level of inquiry that we need to look at with respect to post-approval studies and the determinants of the variation in effectiveness and, and safety in the real world setting has to do with a healthcare provider. And this is very important, although we often do not ask these questions, but we should. Epidemiologists are famous uh, for, certain epidemiologists have become famous for questioning the associations between characteristics of the healthcare providers and the outcomes of their patient. Among the parameters that are important to study when we're looking at healthcare providers and are included the specialty, the amount and type of training, their experience and volume. By volume, we mean how many patients does the healthcare provider treat with this particular condition during the course of a specific time period. When we look at surgical in interventions, volume performance associations become among the most important variables that we look at to try to explain why some patients undergoing the same surgical procedure might have different outcomes. Next slide, please. Next, we need to look at the impact of the healthcare system. We often ignore this, this component in our assessment, and it's a very important factor in, in, in determining the, the health of the population. Factors that are associated with the healthcare system include access to care, regulatory approval, and coverage by insurance. So, when we're looking at epidemiological studies that assess these kinds of associations, we ask ourselves a question, how could the healthcare system impact the delivery of optimal care to our patient population? Next. Finally, <clears throat> we need to look at the behavior of the key players in providing healthcare to the population specifically the patient and the physician. Patient behaviors such as compliance and adherence to treatment are among the most important factors that could affect, that could cause suboptimal effectiveness of a particular treatment. Physician behavior as well could affect how well a particular treatment works. Physician behavior with respect to medical decision-making or physician inertia, according to which physicians tend to not make changes to the, to, the, to the management protocol, despite the fact that they are seeing suboptimal results in their patients. Or in some cases, GPs holding on to patients and not referring them to specialists when the condition of the patient warrants a, uh, an assessment by a, more, uh, a, by a specialist in the field. Next. Now we shift our level of inquiry in these post-approval studies to try and determine if there are any treatment characteristics that could affect the, effect, the safety and effectiveness of the treatment in the real world. Among these, actual effectiveness, <clears throat> in other words, does the medication or the treatment actually work? If it's not working and patients keep taking it, they're likely to stop taking it, and, and therefore we have this vicious circle of lack of compliance and adherence that leads to suboptimal uh, impact on the patient. Tolerability, 
does the does this treatment cause nuisance side effects that aren't very serious but nonetheless affects the patient's willingness and ability ability to take the medication ease of use is this an easy medication to take is it easily uh, administered or does it require complicated processes by which the patient is going to take it within ease of use we also have frequency of administration we all know that it's a lot easier to take medications once a day than three times a day and finally overall patient satisfaction with all of these components including safety effectiveness tolerability and ease of use the patient has to feel that <clears throat> they are actually uh, affecting their health in a positive way for them to continue taking the medication. Next slide. Post-approval real-world studies have been used extensively to assess two very important uh, general parameters, risk-benefit ratios and conducting comparison to alternative treatments, otherwise known as comparative effectiveness. Risk-benefit ratios asks the question as to whether or not we're causing more harm than benefit to the patient and, and whether or not this risk benefit or benefit risk ratio is within an acceptable threshold. Comparison to alternative treatments involves the comparison of a particular treatment to other alternatives. In some cases, the alternatives might be comparing medical treatment to surgical treatment or even comparing treatment to doing nothing. Um, Comparative effectiveness is a very important component of real-world studies because it allows us to determine where we should be allocating resources and which particular treatments we should be supporting for uh, specific uh, conditions. Next. And, of course, health economic assessments. At the end of the day, treatments don't don't come free. Healthcare is expensive, and we need to be able to justify that we are spending an extraordinary amount of money to uh, improve the health of our patient population. We need to have a measure for this, and health economic assessments essentially look at cost-effectiveness ratios, which is how much are we paying per unit of benefit, and benefit could be defined in any number of ways, including how much better does the patient feel, how much morbidity or mortality are we reducing, how much better is the patient's quality of life, or how many, how many patients do we need to treat, as an example, to cure one person, and how much will that cost to, to cure one person of the disease. Incremental cost-effectiveness ratios are just a comparison of the cost-effectiveness of a particular treatment to another alternative treatment. Next slide. Health services research are, is a special branch of real-world studies or epidemiological studies that are concerned with the evaluation of what's going on with respect to the patient, looking at it from 30,000 feet now, not distilling down to the patients themselves. Within health services research, we evaluate healthcare systems, medical decision-making, and regional and small area variations with respect to access of care, quality of care, and variation in care. Those of us that have done some of this work have very sadly discovered early on that what type of treatment and the quality of care that a patient might get does not depend on the patient or the disease, but where they are being treated. And unfortunately, this is true enough even in North America and in Europe or in the Western world. Next slide, please. Now, more recently, many regulatory agencies, including the FDA and the EMA, and slowly even Health Canada are coming along to realize that we don't always need randomized controlled trials to get to an approval level for a particular treatment. In this respect, pragmatic trials or single cohort studies or studies using synthetic controls, which are all involving to a certain degree some type of real, some type of real world evidence, have been becoming increasingly accepted as providing evidence in support of approval of certain medications, 
Most frequently, the approvals are for a new indication, but nonetheless, there is a trend to use these studies for the approval process. Also, there is an, an increasing trend of using these studies to support what we are finding in randomized clinical trials. In other words, our value proposition could become a lot stronger if we have the results of a randomized clinical trial and some real-world evidence to support our premise. Next. Now that we've talked about what real-world studies can do, I just want to briefly outline the different designs that we have available for our uh, to conduct these real-world studies, beginning with the most popular one being the prospective cohort studies. Then case referent and case control studies are probably second in line, and retrospective and cross-sectional uh, retrospective <coughs> cohort studies and cross-sectional studies are probably least frequently used, but nonetheless, they are also quite valuable uh, in, in, in the, the general world of real world studies because they, are, they can be conducted quite quickly and they're not as expensive. Next slide, please. Before we conduct any of these analysis or design our studies, we have to figure out where we're going to get our data. We begin with direct data collection where we can get the data directly from the patients or chart reviews or even some surveys or more recently with the advantages brought to us by large databases and very powerful computers, we can use administrative databases, electronic and medical, electronic medical and hospital records, service and service from physicians, I'm sorry, go back as I mentioned earlier to direct patient collections, uh, direct data, uh, data collection. And of course, we have access to a lot of literature that we can incorporate in our uh, data sources. Next. So what I'd like to talk to you about now a little bit is how, how uh, do, how could real world studies actually help us in our journey of developing a particular treatment. And this is very much relevant, not only to big pharma, but to biotechs as well. As we all know, the first thing we need to do is establish a need. This need is dependent on, the, on demonstrating that there is a treatment gap and a need for a new treatment. Therefore, epidemiological studies health services studies, clinical epidemiology, epide epidemiological studies, and studies evaluating approved treatments can all provide us with the information that we need to establish the need for what we are proposing and we're going to bring to the market. The next level is of inquiry is assessing the demand. While we know that there might be a need, how much of a need is there and what will the demand look like? To, be, to bring an example, you might establish that we need to treat a certain very rare disease. The next question is going to be how much of it, uh, how much of this disease exists and what is the impact of the treatment gap on this disease? Uh, again, if we have a particular rare disease and currently 70% of the patients with a rare disease are cured with the established oh. treatments, there isn't much justification to... Uh, with respect to the potential demand to pursue a new treatment. Once we've answered these questions, we proceed to development, beginning with preclinical development. Next slide. And then we go into clinical development. In order to develop, in order to design our studies and to, to put some justification or rationale as to why we are now pursuing this new treatment and what parameters are we going to be using, we need to establish a threshold. But what do I mean by a threshold is a safety and efficacy threshold. Again, as an example, if the current treatment uh, available to a particular uh, patient population with a specific disease results in a 20% cure, we know that that's the threshold that we need to surpass in order to make, uh, in order to justify the use of a new treatment. 
Now, we ha we don't only look at efficacy thresholds. We also look at uh, safety thresholds. Again, if, it, if the current treatment has an incidence rate of safety of serious adverse events, let's say of 20%, we establish that threshold that we can't surpass a 20% incidence of serious adverse events if we are going to be expecting to be successful in, in the market. Now, in order to identify these thresholds, we can turn to real world evidence and specifically the evaluation of approved treatment that will give us the indices for the effectiveness and safety in the real world for the existing treatments. Again, this will be supplemented by information that we get from randomized controlled trials on other treatments of the same condition. Then we go into, once we've established this and we know the threshold, we design our phase one to phase two and phase three studies. The phase one and the phase one to phase two studies could be helped by looking at the evaluation of existing treatments, in other words, post-approval clinical trials, uh, post-approval uh, observational studies or real-world studies that allow us to see where are we are where are we right now with respect to the effectiveness and safety of the existing treatments in the real world. As I mentioned earlier, once we get into the approval phase or phase three studies, we can incorporate new designs such as pragmatic trials and synthetic controls to help us uh, promote or support uh, the, the hypothesis of effectiveness and safety of the new treatment. And finally, once we've passed the phase three uh, milestone and we are now ready to look at approval, we need to put in front of payers the value proposition that we can get from epidemiological and health economic studies. Next slide, please. Those of us that work with biotechs understand that their major challenge is raising funds and support for, for, their, for their companies uh, and, and, and to fund their, their, the development of their asset or the drug development program. What investors ask is, uh, the questions that investors ask more often are, what is the return of my investment and how can I sustain this return? Or for how long can I expect to see a return of my investment uh, if I were to put money into this particular asset? Epidemiological studies evaluating current treatments uh, and post-marketing studies in the real world allow us to establish the need, which defines the demand, which then defines the market size, which is directly linked into the market value. Support of the market value could come with a competitive advantage that we will demonstrate with our product. And again, this could be benchmarked against real world studies uh, of assessing current treatments. The market value, of course, will be driven by revenues and the revenues will be uh, a direct function of how much we can charge for the treatment, which is related to the value proposition, and we can get good insight on our potential value proposition through health economics, uh, health economic studies. Uh, this way, if you, if we prepare ourselves properly, we can convince investors or demonstrate to investors or even assess for ourselves whether investing in this particular product will be feasible from a financial perspective and sustainable. And I think that uh, that is the end. Thank you very much. Great. That, that really was a terrific talk. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the, uh, you going through that because certainly real world data is becoming increasingly important uh, in our in our regulated environment to to, perf uh, to support not only um, uh, to provide supportive data uh, for 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 IND filings or, or NDA filings, but also for uh, uh, even potential um, uh, uh, indication expansion. I think it was Progita, uh where they got a, a, a indicate a, a expansion for male breast cancer based on yeah. real world data as opposed to uh, uh, randomized controlled data. 
Uh, and there have been several studies where they used pragmatic trials for asthma and some uh, uh, autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. with thousands, thousands of patients being enrolled without involving any randomization or, or control. Yep. Just observational work. Yeah, no, I think that that's really terrific. And uh, uh, thank you for highlighting, uh, you know, the importance of real world data and epidemiolo uh, good epidemiologic studies. You're welcome. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, John, again, for your presentation. If you wish to connect with him and his colleague, Mr. Peter Hessels, um, you can do so via our meeting scheduler. Um, so I will be transferring everyone now to the next room.